it's great to be here. I've been looking forward to it, and I've heard about your church now for, I don't know, months or a year or more, and uh, it's just a delight to get to be here today. Uh, we're going to be talking about finding your sweet spot. Are you familiar with that term? Does that make sense to you, finding your sweet spot? Have you ever talk, spoken in those terms? I think it's a term that comes from the game of golf which I play maybe once a year with friends. Uh, and, and when I play golf, I might hit the ball about 100, 110 times, which tells you, if you know anything about golf, just how bad of a golfer I am. But there will be one or two moments where I actually hit the ball well. It feels good. It, it flies like it just sails through the air and it just seems effortless, that's, that's the sweet spot. That's what golfers call hitting the sweet spot, hitting it just right. And you know, we all want to have our lives be like that, don't we? I'm, I'm all about finding my sweet spot, aren't you? We want, we want to have, uh, we want to be doing what we do really well, and we want things to just be effortless, and we want it to be enjoyable and fruitful and, and good and easy all the time. That it's just a natural, whatever we're doing, that it is a natural fit for who we are, for our gifts, our abilities, and, uh, and all of that. And so every, we, we want to have a sweet... And in fact, I think these days, as we've become more and more uh, progressed and economically and all of those kinds of things, we, we get to the point where we think that this is, this is kind of a right. This is something that everyone should be able to do, is to find that, that sweet spot in our lives and do just the things that we are most, in, just the things that we most enjoy doing and that we're best at. But it's not always been that way. You know, my grandparents... Uh, generation, they just found a job and stayed in that job for a lifetime. No matter how mind-numbingly boring it might have been, that wasn't their life. It was just something they did so that they could live their life. They weren't obsessed with finding a sweet spot. In fact, they would think that our generation was just a little bit too preoccupied with ourselves. You know, it's kind of a we're, we're spoiled in thinking that we must enjoy what we're doing all the time. And people in, in developing countries today even might look at us being preoccupied and worried about finding just the right fit for us when they're just trying to survive day to day. And they would think of this idea of having to find a sweet spot as something that's just kind of a preoccupation of people who have too much time and too much money on their hands and uh, just, just a way for wealthy North Americans to feel sorry for themselves, you know. So is finding a sweet spot really something that we should be about? Or is it just a selfish sort of preoccupation? Uh, and yet, we do believe, it's part of our belief system, that God has a purpose for every life that He has something that He wants to do in each of our lives, and that we find joy in doing that. So here's the question today. What is the sweet spot that we should be looking for, and how do we find it? And to do that, I want to look at the example of Moses. I want to look at a particular moment in the life of Moses. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 3, so if you have your Bibles, you can find that or find it on your phone. In Exodus 3, actually the first two chapters of Exodus have covered 80 years of Moses' life. Uh, so it's, it's been going pretty fast. Moses was born, he was born as, uh, as a slave in Egypt, and he was born at a time when the, the Egyptian pharaoh was putting to death all of the new Hebrew infants who were born among that massive group of Hebrew slaves that they had in Egypt. And so he was putting them to death, so Moses was was hidden by his family, and then he was found by a princess in the Egyptian court, and then he grew up in, the, in that Egyptian court. He spent his first 40 years as kind of an Egyptian prince, and then he was, he was seeing his, his uh, Hebrew brothers 
being abused one day and he reacted. He tried to take matters into his own hand. He killed a, an Egyptian slave master and then he was a fugitive from justice. He spent the next 40 years out in the desert taking care of sheep and uh, in Midian and take uh, the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro. And this is where we find him in Exodus chapter 3 at 80 years old when God t comes to him and tells him, I'm wanting to do something new in your life. And so let, we'll start reading there in the very first verse of Exodus chapter 3. It says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of a bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Moses said to himself. Why isn't that bush burning up? I must go see it. When the Lord saw Moses coming to take a closer look, God called to him from the middle of the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, Moses replied. Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptian and lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey, the land where the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. Look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me, and I have seen how harshly the Egyptians abused them. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must, be, you must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you, and this is your sign that I am the one who has sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will worship God at this very mountain. But Moses protested. If I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they will ask, what is his name? Then what should I tell them? And God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. We'll stop there for a minute. So what are we learning about Moses? And what are we learning about finding our sweet spot in this situation? Moses, God says to Moses, I'm going to deliver the people of Israel out of Egypt. They've cried out to me. I've heard their cry. And so I'm sending you. And Moses protests instantly. And he protests with a couple of questions. The first question is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I that I should be the person to do this? There's a very different... Moses has one idea of who he is, and God has another idea of who he is. Moses' idea of who he is, I, I am this guy, I've been condemned twice in my life. First, I was condemned as a child when I was born, and, that, and then I'm condemned now as a fugitive from justice in Egypt. I'm, I'm someone who's been rejected by everyone. I was rejected by my own people. They, they look at me with suspicion because I, I grew up, I didn't grow up as a slave like all of them. I grew up as a prince in the court of the, of the of Pharaoh, of the king of Egypt. And then I'm rejected by the by the people that I grew up with in the court of the Pharaoh because I'm not one of them either. I don't belong anywhere. And my life is... And now I'm, I'm here on the backside of the desert, of the wilderness, keeping somebody else's sheep. Moses had come to the point where he felt like, this is the best I can do. I'm just going to... This is my sweet spot. This is my comfort zone. I'm just a shepherd in the wilderness 
following sheep around, taking care of someone else's sheep. He figured that was as far as it was going to go for him. But God had a different view of Moses. You know, I don't think that when God heard the people cry out from Egypt, he didn't go out and do a job search. He didn't hire a headhunter to go find the right person, a recruiter to go find somebody. He didn't, he didn't put out an ad to say who would take this job. God had already been preparing somebody for 80 years for this exact job. When God looked at Moses, he saw something completely different. He saw a man who, who was a Hebrew, and he understood the Hebrew experience. He, he even, and, he, and he understood in a way that no other Hebrew had. He, he could see it from the outside. He had a different perspective on the world. He was also someone who was comfortable in the Egyptian court. He knew his way around. He knew where the throne room was, and he could walk right up to Pharaoh, and he knew what he had to say to him. He had both of those experiences. And not only that, he had now spent 40 years living in the same wilderness through which God was going to lead his people. He was exactly the right person for this job. Who am I? What do we learn from this? Well, we learn, we learn two or three things, I, th I think. First of all, we learn that, that, God is, uh, that God doesn't waste anything. God wastes nothing. Every experience in our lives, every hard time, every good time, every encouraging time, every discouraging time, God can use to shape us and to prepare us for what He wants to do. Another thing that we learn is that God never stops working on us. We used to teach our kids a little song that, that said, He's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took Him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the moon and Jupiter and Mars. How Faithful and patient he must be because he's still working on me. God's, God never stops working on us. We, taught, we used to teach that in VBS. You might not have done that one this week, but it's a great VBS song. Right? He doesn't stop working. He's working on us all the time. He's shaping us. He's forming us. He's making us who he wants us to be all the time. And then another thing that we learn is that it's never too late to hear God's voice. Moses had tried to do it his way and failed. He had failed miserably. But now God was speaking to him. And in this moment, he had the opportunity to discover what God had in store for him. Important lessons for all of us. God doesn't waste anything. He never stops working on us. And it's never too late to hear him. Now, Moses' second question was, God, who are you? And his main concern is he's going, to, he's going to go to these people. He's going to go to the Hebrew people who are slaves there, and he's going to say, God has sent me. And they go, How? you're not the person we were expecting. You know, you're not the, we, we've kind of turned our back on you years ago. Why, would we, why should we expect that God would be working for you? Who was it actually who spoke to you? Who is the God who spoke to you. And God says, you, you tell them uh, who I am. God, Moses was learning some things about God through this whole experience. The first thing was that he, he was standing there in front of a bush that was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. That was the first thing that amazed him. What's going on here? And it wasn't his last encounter with a burning fire. Because he would come back to that same mountain a little while later and receive the revelation of God from on the mountain and it would be filled with smoke and fire that also didn't have any kind of source. My watch is talking to me for some reason. So then, then he would be... Uh, then he would, uh, as he led the people in Israel through the wilderness, pillar of fire. There's no explanation for why this fire is burning out there except that God is, is leading His people through the wilderness following this pillar of fire. God reveals Himself 
as the one who has no need of anything to sustain him. He's like a fire that burns without needing any fuel whatsoever. He's holy. He's transcendent. He's other. He's glorious. He's grand. That is how God reveals himself. But then not only that, he's the God who is writing the story. He says, I'm the God of, of, of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. I'm the God of your fathers. You tell them that's who has sent, is sending you. I'm the one who's been writing the story all along, and now I'm ready to write a cha another chapter and give you an experience of who I am that you will never forget. And then he gives him a name. He says, you want a name? This is my name. I am. The actual word is Yahweh. It's his personal covenant name. He's saying to, to Moses and by extension to the people of Israel, I am not only this transcendent, amazing, awesome, grand God. I am the God who is here, who is with you, who is present with you all the way. And by the way, when Moses had his, his uh, reluctance about, about his ability and who he was, God didn't recite his, his resume to him. He didn't, say, he didn't say, Moses, you can handle this. I've been investing all of this in you all along. You have all the skills that are necessary. He said, I am with you. That's all you need. I am with you. And Moses, eventually, before the story of o is over, he comes to realize that that is the only thing that matters, is that God is with him. And so here's Moses. He's this broken down shepherd. And he's having an encounter with Almighty God, who is speaking to him where he is, inviting him into his presence to sink his toes down into the sand of that holy ground of his presence. And what's he learning about God? Well, he's learning that God is, reveals himself as transcendent. Let's go ahead and have that point up there. That uh, Whoops. Okay. All right. Well, he reveals himself as a transcendent. He, we don't get to create God. We don't get to make God. He creates us. He doesn't, uh, we, we don't get to make God in our image. We're made in his image. And not only that, we don't get to define God. He's the one who defines us. And we don't get to recruit God for our agenda. He calls us into his agenda. These are important things for us to know about who God is. We don't create Him. We don't define Him. We don't recruit Him. He creates us. He defines us. He calls us into His purpose and His agenda. So what can we say about finding our sweet spot so far? You know, we might be able to say, well, finding my sweet spot is, is not about what what I do for myself or for my family or for my community or for other people. It's what, what you do for God that really matters. We might also say that it's not something that you can choose. It's not something you can find. It's not something you discover or achieve or accomplish. It's something that you're called to. This is, this is your sweet spot. And those... And, and it's not about gaining fulfillment. You know, we're really preoccupied with being fulfilled. But it's about fulfilling God's purpose in our lives. And those are really good answers. Those are pretty good Sunday school answers, what I'd call good Sunday school answers. But I think there's more to it. Because this, this also seems like a lot of work, figuring this out. And it also seems still a little bit me-centered. But... I want to think a minute about this mountain that he's on. Calls us the, it, it calls it Mount Horeb at the beginning. It's also what we later come to know as Mount Sinai. It's the, mount, the mountain of the Lord. It's, Moses come, ends up going up this mountain seven, seven different times in Exodus. And every time he goes, it's to hear something from God. It's for God to reveal something to him. It's the mountain of meeting. And, uh, and, 
and it's, it's an amazing place to encounter God. But it's not the only mountain in Moses' life. There's also Mount Pisgah that comes later in Deuteronomy 34 at the very end of Moses' life as the children of Israel are finally going into the promised land after wandering in the wilderness for another 40 years. Do the math. He's 120 years old at this point. And he climbs a mountain at that age. And he's able to, he, he doesn't get to go into the promised land, but he gets to look over into the promised land. This is what I call the mountain of perspective. This is where Moses is able to stop and look and see just what God has been doing with his life and realize that it's not about him. It's about what God is doing in the world around him and through him and realizing I don't get to go into the promised land, but look, there they go. They're going in. God is moving his purpose forward. You know, I, I can look back on my own life and there are times... You know, I've had several seasons in my life. I was pastor of a church in Texas for several years. And uh, when I left that church to become a missionary and go to Portugal, uh, I thought that that church had had some problems, that it had been through some stuff, but it was healthy, it was doing well. I thought this church is going to be here as a monument to what a great pastor I am. And then about a year later, they got into a big fight and the whole thing split. It just blew up and they ended up selling this amazing building they had to another church that was split off of another church in the area. You know, it was like, oh man, all my effort. And yet as I look back, I know that there, I, every once in a while I run across people who were in that church during that time and God has been at work in their lives through the years and continued things that he started in that moment. We went to Portugal and we were there for about 10 years and, and our missions organization was wanting to have church planting movements and we were trying to plant churches, trying to plant churches. We, we weren't very successful at it. But as I go back every couple of years now, I see my old students see God working in their lives, through their lives, to do the things that we dreamed of seeing. Moses didn't go in, get to go into the promised land himself, but he could climb up to the mountain of perspective and see what God is doing is bigger and grander than just me. The mountain of perspective. But you know, Moses did actually get in get to put his feet in that promised land hundreds of years later on another mountain, the mountain of transfiguration. You remember when Jesus, Jesus takes a couple of his disciples up on a mountain and suddenly they see Moses and Elijah standing there with him shortly before his crucifixion and resurrection talking about all that God has done. This is what I call the mountain of wonder. This is where we stop and realize just, we need to stop every once in a while and just realize that God is doing something in Christ that is salvation for the entire world and just stand in awe of what He's done and what He's doing. The mountain of wonder. So here's, Here's the main thing I want you to hear today about our sweet spot. That our sweet spot is not, not just about, doesn't come from what we might do for God. It comes from what God has done for us and what He's doing in us. That it's not about finding the perfect fit for my life. It's not about me at all. It's about what God has done in Christ and what He wants to do in and around my life. And when I surrender myself in obedience to Him, to what He wants to do around me, I get to experience the joy of that effortless experience of what God wants to do in me. So how do you get there? Well, you need to pay, you need to go to those three mountains. You need, to, you need to have a space in your life on a regular basis where you go to the mountain of meeting just to hear from God, just to experience God. You're not going to hear from God on a regular basis unless you stop to listen to God on a regular basis. 
Find your place to meet with God. Carve out that time, that space in your life to meet with Him. And then you need to find, go to that mountain of perspective. You need to just stop and realize it's not all about you. And look around you and see what God's doing around you. See what God's doing. Look at those kids that you served this week in Vacation Bible School. And just think about, you know, what, what might God do through their lives? That's an amazing thought. And then spend some time on the mountain of, of wonder. Just stop to think about everything that God has done in Christ and what He's doing. And when you do that, you come to realize that the sweet spot is not about all the stuff that you get to do for God. It's about what God is doing in and through you. And when you find that spot, life is joy regardless of, of the circumstances, whether you have a good week or a bad week, or whether things are going great or things are not going so great, or whether you're you're full of energy and, and, and vitality, or you're just worn out from chasing kids all week. In all of those moments, we can live in the sweet spot, sweet spot of God's purpose in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for uh, the fact that you do come to us in moments. You take the, the brokenness of our lives and the stuff that we, we... You see us differently from the way we see ourselves. And all of the things that we look on that we see as weaknesses and failures, you see as opportunities to shape and mold us into who you want us to be. And Lord, we thank you that in all of your grandeur and, and glory, you have also expressed your grace by coming to us and you've ultimately done that through the person of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that, that in Him we find all that we need and that the world finds all that it needs. Lord, help us to live in your story, live from your story, and help us, Lord, to share your story with the world around us and there discover the sweet spot of your grace in our lives every single day. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.